a quiet but warm welcome for Mike Bostock, everyone. All right, thank you. Uh, so if you've ever gotten frustrated trying to figure out why your code didn't work or how someone else's code work, um, maybe it was my code, and I'm so sorry, uh, you are not alone, uh, and this talk is for you. Um, you know, as Max mentioned, for the last eight years or so, depending how you count, um, I've been building tools for visualizing information, and the most successful outcome of this effort has been this D3 JavaScript library for visualization. I, I mean, I've spent far more work than I expected on this uh, uh, when I made that initial commit, um, but I mean that in a good way. I mean, it's been really exciting to see uh, what people have done with it. Um, but there's a danger when you spend so long designing a single tool, and that is that you may forget what the tool is for, right? The tool itself becomes the goal uh, rather than the value derived from its application. So the purpose of a tool for visualization is to construct visualizations. But what is the purpose of visualization? So in Ben Schneiderman, the purpose of visualization is insight, not pictures. This is actually an adaptation of a Richard Hamming quote, which is the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. So the point here is that visualization is also a tool. It is a means to an end, a means to insight, a way to think, to study, to understand, uh, to discover, uh, to communicate something about the world. So if we only consider the task of constructing visualizations, of assigning visual encodings, then we ignore myriad other challenges, finding relevant data, cleaning it, transforming it into efficient structures for analysis, uh, designing statistical analysis, building models, validating those models, uh, and ultimately communicating whatever it is that we learn in that process. And these tasks are often performed in code. And coding is famously difficult. Even the name code suggests impenetrability. Right? Code originally referred to machine code is low-level digital instructions sent to be executed by a processing unit. And code has come a long way since that. You know, it's much more human friendly. Uh, but it's got a long way to go. I kind of love this image. I mean, to me, it's like the fantasy of the developer when they're writing code. Um, but it's also a little bit strange because it's like it's a robot. I mean, why is the robot typing? Can it just like plug in and, and send the bytes <laughs> directly to the computer? It's like the, the robot is being forced to use the human interface uh, rather than vice versa. OK, to give a comically dense example, uh, this is a bash command I wrote recently to generate a choropleth of population density of California. The rest of the talk will just be this slide, and I'm going to <laughs> walk you through all 15 commands here. Um, I, I mean, it's kind of funny. I mean, look, look at this. Like, what, what is it doing exactly? It, you look at it, and you think I mean, it starts with this geo to topo, right? This is converting geojson to topojson. But that's not really where this program starts, because that takes like this giant thing as input, and then that command actually takes like these two things as input. Uh, so there are multiple levels of nesting here. Uh, there's like these weird sort of punctuation marks. What do they mean? Uh, there are these abbreviations like dash P and dash F and of course like the backslashes. Um, and if you notice, there's actually two languages here. Like this is not just bash. This is actually JavaScript expressions that are awkwardly embedded within bash. Uh, but this is, you know, this isn't machine code. Like from the machine's perspective, this is extremely high level programming. Um, but it's, it's hardly natural language. Uh, so Brett Victor gives this concise definition of programming. Programming is blindly manipulating symbols. And by blindly, he means that we can't see the results of our manipulation. Right? We can edit a program, we can rerun it, we can diff the output, but programs are complex and dynamic. And so this approach is not really a direct or an immediate observation of our edit. And by symbols, he means that we don't sort of directly manipulate the output of our programs. We operate in abstractions. And these abstractions can be powerful, but they can also be difficult to grasp. Um, in other words, or in Donald Norman's terms, these are the gulf of evaluation and the gulf of execution. OK, but clearly, some code is easier to understand than others. And one of the things that I first think of in human code is spaghetti, or spaghetti code. Code that lacks structure or modularity, where in order to understand one part of a program, you have to understand the entire program. It can't be disentangled. And this is frequently caused by shared mutable state. 
right? When you have multiple parts of a program that are writing to the same piece of state, it becomes much harder to reason about what that state's value is. And indeed, how do we even know what programs do? If we can't track the complete runtime state of a program in our heads, uh, then reading code is insufficient, right? So we use logs, we use debuggers, we tests, um, but these tools are also limited. A debugger, for example, can only show you the value of a few symbols at a single moment in time. So we can't observe complex data structures or complex patterns of execution. And in a way, like, we continue to have great difficulty understanding code, and it's a miracle that anything works at all. But despite these challenges, uh, we're still writing code, you know, for myriad applications and more than ever before. And so why is that? Like, are we masochists? Maybe. Uh, are we unable to change? I mean, I think in part, certainly, some of us, some more than others. Um, is there no better solution? And in general, and that is the critical qualifier, no. Code is often the best tool we have because it is the most general tool we have. Code has almost unlimited expressiveness. So alternatives to code, as well as higher level programming interfaces and languages, can do well in specific domains. But these alternatives must sacrifice generality in order to achieve greater efficiency within their domain. If you can't constrain the domain, it's unlikely that you'll find a viable replacement for code. There is no universal replacement, at least not while humans primarily think and communicate through language. And it's hard to constrain the domain of science. Science is fundamental. It's studying the world, extracting meaning from empirical observations, simulating systems, communicating quantitative results. And a medium to support discovery must be capable of expressing novel thought. Just as we don't use phrasal templates or Mad Libs for composing the written word, we can't be limited to chart templates for constructing visualizations or a dropdown of formulas for statistical analysis. We need more than configuration. We need the composition of primitives into creations of our own design. So if our goal is to help people gain insight from observation, we must consider the problem of how people code. Brett Victor, I will quote him several times in this talk, uh, had the following to say about math, uh, but it applies equally to code. The power to understand and predict the quantities of the world should not be restricted to those with a freakish knack for manipulating abstract symbols. The point here is that improving the human experience of coding is not just about making your workflow more convenient or more efficient. It empowers people to better understand their world. So if we can't eliminate coding, can we at least make it easier for humans with our sausage fingers and our finite-sized brains? Um, to explore this question um, for the last six months or so, um, I've been prototyping building this thing I call the Integrated Discovery Environment, um, D3 Express. And it's for exploratory data analysis, for understanding systems and algorithms, for teaching and sharing techniques and code, and for sharing interactive visual explanations. I do want to make visualization easier and discovery easier, but first we need to make coding easier. Now, I cannot pretend to make coding easy. The ideas we wish to express, explain, and explore may be irreducibly complex, but by reducing the cognitive burden of coding my hope is to make the analysis of quantitative phenomena accessible to a wider audience. Now, the first principle of D3 Express is reactivity. Uh, rather than issuing commands to modify this shared state, each piece of state in a reactive program defines how it is calculated. And the runtime manages their evaluation. It propagates derived state. Now, that's a lot of sort of technical words, but if you've written spreadsheet formulas, you've done reactive programming. So here's a simple notebook in D3 Express to illustrate this concept. It looks a little bit like the browser's developer console, except here our work is saved automatically so that we can revisit it in the future uh, and share it with others. Right, so in imperative programming, C equals A plus B is a value assignment. That means it takes the value of A, adds it to the value of B, and copies that into the symbol C. And so in imperative programming, if the value of A or B changes, the value of C doesn't update until you recompute that same addition. But in reactive programming, C equals A plus B is a variable definition, which means that as here, when I change the value of B from 2 to 3, the value of C changes to 4 
If I change A from one to four, again, the value of C updates. If I change B to be math.random, again, it updates. So the point here is that as programmers, we now care only about the current state because the runtime manages state changes. And that's a small thing when you're only adding two numbers together, but when you have larger programs, this eliminates a substantial burden. Now, of course, a uh, discovery environment needs to do more than add a few numbers, so let's try working with data. We're gonna load D3, and because this is CSV conf, we're gonna load a CSV. And now we wanna see what that is, so we can click and inspect. Um, but already, there's some cool stuff that's happening here. So one is that requiring D3, loading D3, and likewise fetching this data, they're asynchronous operations. Um, now, if you don't know what that is, it kind of doesn't matter, that's the beautiful thing about this, because you can treat this reactive code uh, as if it were synchronous code, meaning that anything that depends on D3 in this notebook doesn't get evaluated until D3 is loaded. And likewise, any expression that you write that refers to the data won't, get be, won't be evaluated until the data is loaded. And this avoids the sort of famous challenge of callback hell that you get with imperative asynchronous code. So what does the data look like? We can click, we can inspect, and just open it up here. One of the things that you'll notice is that these fields, they're all strings, right? So the date is a string, and the close field is a string. This is uh, stock data for like the last or five years or so of like Apple stock daily closes. Um, and in order to work with this data, one of the things that we're gonna have to do is convert this from string type to a more precise type. Like we wanna work with numbers, we wanna work with dates. So what I'm doing right now is I'm passing in this row accessor function to try to specify what those types are. You notice when I go in here in d.close, I put the little plus sign in front of that. That is JavaScript's way of converting a string into a number. Uh, it's the unary plus operator. And the point here is that as I make that change, you're immediately seeing what the result is. Right? So we're still doing sort of abstract symbol manipulation here, but at least we're doing that less blindly because we're seeing the result immediately. So we can do the same thing with dates, except JavaScript doesn't sort of have native support for parsing this date format. So what would happen if we just called a hypothetical function called parse time? Well, we can call it, and of course it returns an error because that is not defined. It's not sort of a built-in primitive. But this kind of raises another point, which is that the errors that you see in these notebooks, they're no longer global errors. They don't bring your whole program to a halt. The other cells that you have in your notebook can continue to run, and these errors are temporary, so that when I go in and I define parse time, the error automatically goes away. And so again, this is one of the things that reactive programming gets you in, in terms of being more structured programming. It's a bit like when your formulas in your spreadsheet, they just say invalid value, but Excel doesn't crash when you mistype the formula. So here I've, I've changed, I've defined my date parser, and now I have nice green dates in my data set, and now I can start to ask questions of my data. So I'll use D3 for that, and I'll say D3 extent, the data, you know, D dot date. Uh, but this raises another point, which is that I actually forgot to give the data set a name. I give the data a name, and then it automatically reevaluates that. And this raises another interesting feature here, which is that this notebook is now order independent. Because it understands the references between these cells, you can write the code in any order that you want. So I can refer to data up here in this cell, but the data isn't defined until down here. This is useful for sort of having a cleaner structure to your code. It's also useful when you go to publish your results or you want to communicate those with other people. You have total freedom in terms of how you order your code and how you explain it. You're not required to, for example, put all of your requires or your imports at the top of the file. You can just let the narrative determine how you want to order the code. Okay. So like the developer console, the output of each cell is visible immediately below that cell. But unlike the developer console, we can have visual outputs. So now I want to take the same data and make a little line chart out of it. So I'm going to define the width and height and the margins for that as like three different variables. Uh, then go up and look at our data, the extents that we computed, and turn those into domains of a scale. So these scales, this D3 concept, and it's mapping sort of these abstract dimensions of data to visual encodings here, like a position in X and Y. So I'm just updating those definitions. And once those are defined, we can create an SVG element to contain the output of our chart. I'm gonna use the curly braces because this will be a little bit more of an involved 
definition than the other ones, which are expressions. So now I can sort of put more JavaScript code in here. And I'm using D3 select to do that. And I've got this like dom.svg. I mean, the details aren't really that important, but this is really just creating a, an SVG element of the given width and height and then returning that. And that's sort of the basics that we're just working with like web standards here and vanilla DOM. So the first thing I wanna do for this chart is to make sure that my sort of dimensions of data look correct. So I plug in the axis here. Now by default, like an axis in D3 is gonna be rooted at the origin, which is zero, zero in the top left corner. And so I wanna shift that down so that it's on the bottom of my chart. So I go in here and I, I put the transform attribute on my G element and I give it the right sort of height minus margin dot bottom. And so then that moves down. It's a little bit off the screen here, but you get the idea. Likewise, I can make the left axis here for the Y scale and then put that on the left side of the chart. Okay, so now we have our little axes and now we wanna actually draw the data. We wanna see the data. We're gonna need a path element for that. Path elements in SVG require this D attribute, which tends to be this complicated thing. This is a whole like micro language in SVG for making these things. Um, we would don't wanna do that by hand. So there's a D3 line primitive and we're gonna pass our data to that line function in order to construct uh, the geometry for the chart. So I'll do that now. Um, that's configurable again, so we're gonna pass in our X scale and the corresponding like value from the data. So X and Y here. How do I close? Okay, so that shows up. Obviously it doesn't look correct, uh, but that's because paths in SVG are filled black by default. And we want to stroke, stroke it for a line chart. So again, we'll go in here and we'll, we'll set the fill style to none and the stroke to blue. Okay, so now we have a basic little line chart here with a few, few different cells. Okay, but even though this is a basic line chart, uh, the program's topology is starting to become more complex. And so this is a directed acyclic graph of references within this notebook. So this is showing you the structure of the program. Uh, and this visualization was itself made in D3 Express using graphes. There's a command you can run to produce this thing. Um, so you've got the require at the top, that's how you load the libraries, it generates D3, and then we use D3 to make our time parsing function. We also use that to parse the data and load the data. You've got your width, height, and margins. Those feed into the X and Y scales, and then basically everything feeds into the SVG node, which doesn't have a name, so it's just number 93 at the bottom. Um, so a few observations of this chart. So one thing is that it's now trivial to make this chart responsive, right? The width, height, and margins are constants as we've, as we've defined them. But if we changed them so that they were the size of the screen or the size of the window, then the chart would update automatically. And likewise, we can replace the data definition. So rather than a static definition, maybe we want a real-time chart. And so that's just a question of replacing that definition with another definition and everything else sort of falls out of it. But I wanna look a little bit more closely at the code here so you can get a sense of how this reactive programming affects your code structure. So this is sort of like typical D3 code that you might see on uh, blocks.org. And the idea is like, I'm defining a scale here, I would define the scale, or I would declare the scale on page load, and then I'd have to wait till the data loaded in order to set the domain. And so there's this scale object here, but really my definition of that scale kind of gets distributed throughout my program where I have a whole bunch of unrelated code here. And this is obviously a very pared down example. This is not a complete chart. It wouldn't fit on a slide for one thing. Um, but you can already get a sense of like how, how the code ends up being harder to follow and more distributed because of the statefulness of this program. Whereas in reactive programming, we can localize those definitions because it's now the runtime's responsibility to manage the order of execution. And it knows that this X scale depends on the data and it knows that it depends on D3 and the margins. And so we can just define it in a way that makes more sense and let the runtime handle it. Now, the last thing on charts is that you don't have to use D3 in order to make charts in D3 Express. I mean, it is called D3 Express. Maybe that was a mistake, but uh, you know, you can use Vegalite, you can use 3JS, you can use whatever it is that you want. Um, all of these things are just JavaScript and DOM. So this is the same sort of data set. Uh, I put a log scale on the chart, um, but this is using Vegalite. And to me, this is also a really exciting opportunity because as you sort of make it easier for people to explore data sets, you can also explore other of these more domain-specific, higher-level abstractions uh, 
and still have the benefit that you get with the reactive programming. Okay, so how about Canvas? I've got another notebook here, uh, and I want to make a, a globe. So I've loaded D3Geo and top of JSON, and then the topology of like world county or country boundaries. And I'm going to create a Canvas element, similar like we did with the DOM.SVG. Uh, get the context from that, and then we're going to draw a bunch of uh, Canvas commands in order to get the, the world to appear. Um, so for that, again, you know, you have this path object where you're passing in your geometry. What is that? Well, there's a D3 geo path function which takes geojson and turns it into a string of, or a sequence of Canvas draw commands. That requires a projection, which for here we'll use an orthographic projection. Uh, and so now it just appears. So I'll take that and like, let's say I wanted to draw the outline of the earth as well. Um, so for that, I'll need a sphere object. So I break that out to a sort of separate definition here, plug that back in. And so now we have a nice little globe here. But one of the powerful features, as I hinted at when we were looking at the directed graph, is that we can sort of take one of these definitions or one of these variables, like in this case, the projection, and we can replace a static definition of this orthographic projection and put in a dynamic definition. So something that's animated, let's say. So here's the Mercator projection or equirectangular. Um, but now I want to make it so that it's a rotating orthographic projection. Okay, so the way that I'm doing that, I'm sort of like glossing over some JavaScript details here, but uh, this, is, this is a generator. So I'll, I'll, I guess a lot of people haven't used JavaScript generators, but I only like honestly discovered them a few months ago. But they are remarkably cool for doing this sort of stuff. Uh, you'll see how it works in a second. Um, basically, it's a function that can yield a sequence of values. So normally a function just returns one value, but in this case, like, it can yield an infinite stream of values. So this is going to create an orthographic projection, and then just inside of a wild true loop, it's going to set the rotation angles for that projection, uh, and then you get a rotating globe here. I'll tilt it a little bit, because northern hemisphere specific. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so generators, um, they're pretty cool. Um, now, one of the things you may be wondering is, like, how does this work, right? Like, how, how is it that the generator, um, oh, let me go back here. Um, why doesn't it just go into, like, a, why doesn't it hang the page? It's a while true loop. And the, the answer is that generators are a pull system. So it's the runtime that's pulling new values from this generator at, at 60 times per second. Um, rather than it sort of like pushing new values is whenever they get updated. Um, I'm going like to skip ahead a little bit here. Now, one of the cool things um, you can do in addition, um, or you may be wondering, like when you have these generators, let's see, um, you know, what is it doing with the canvas? And the answer is that it's just throwing away the canvas and creating a new canvas every time that it needs to draw. And uh, that actually works just fine in this example because it's not very um, expensive. It's a pretty simple geometry that it's displaying. Um, but obviously, that's a lot of overhead, and it would limit the sort of things that you can do. Uh, so the thing I'm showing you now is that you can change that behavior by just accessing the previous canvas that you used. And of course, when you do that, it starts smearing. But you can add this clear command so that it's clear before you redraw. And then you're fixing the line width as well. And so the point here is that you can opt in. It's looped now already. Too late. I hope you got it. Um, <laughs> you, you get the simplicity of the reactive model, um, but if you want to like opt into a little more complexity, you also don't have to pay the performance cost for that. There's negligible overhead compared to what you would write in vanilla JavaScript. OK, so just to reiterate, to look at the code a little bit, this was our static definition of the projection. Uh, and this is our generator, which defines the rotating projection. And so every time a new value is pulled from this generator, it sets the new rotation angles based on the current time uh, and then yields that value. OK, so generators are good for scripted animations, but what about interaction? Well, it turns out we can use generators for those too. Uh, it's just that our generators are now asynchronous, and they yield a value whenever there's new input rather than just yielding it at a fixed rate. So, the first thing I'm going to need in order to make this interactive is I'm going to need a little slider. And again, this is just DOM, so I'm creating an input element type range with these values. It's not hooked up to anything, so of course, like dragging that back and forth doesn't do anything. But I'll give that a name. And then we can define a generator that emits the value of that range slider. So now I can see, OK, it's going from minus 180 to plus 180 as I'm dragging it. I give that a name, call that the angle. 
and then we feed that angle into our projection rotation. So now when I drag the slider, it's now interactive, right? I can sort of spin the earth around. Um, now because this is a very sort of common case where you're defining a user interface and you want that to drive something in your code, there's a view of operator which does exactly the things that I just showed you, but it does it sort of within a single definition. So there's the input slider that you're declaring here, that's the user interface or the graphical interface, and then there's the value of that, which is the programming interface, so that's the angle that the, the code sees to drive the projection. Okay, so again, this is the code, so this is sort of like a long form where I'm declaring my projection and its rotation takes an angle. That angle is derived from this range input, and the range input, it just goes from minus 180 to plus 180. And this is the shorthand form using the view of operator. Okay, but we now have the ability to generate arbitrary inputs, right? This is not just sort of, you're limited to sort of a fixed palette of a range slider and a drop down menu. In this case, like I'm, I'm making this table and it's got like three sliders. I'm making a color picker for the cube helix color space. And I want this, uh, the output of this complex input to be a cube helix color instance. So that's the code that I'm writing here, which basically takes the values from those sliders. It updates their corresponding output, so as you're dragging it, you can see that the hue angle is changing there to the right. Uh, and then below that, you can see this color object. That's kind of the output of our interface here. And then I'm using that to sort of set the background color of this div. So the point is, like, you're just doing sort of DOM and HTML here, but there's a really nice primitive for you to sort of hook that into the, the programming system, into the reactive programming environment. Okay, now for visualization, this has sort of even more interesting applications. So this is a histogram. It's looking at sort of the, the price of, of 500 or so stocks um, in January 2012 relative to their price in January 2011. So you can see that there's a, a bell curve here, and the mode of that is like slightly greater than one because of course like the average return on stocks tends to be positive. Uh, but there's also a long tail where you have like stocks that did really well and you had stocks that did really poorly. Now, if you wanted to know exactly what those stocks were, in another environment, you might have to write separate code in order to query that and to look at the results. But here, we can augment this visualization with a little bit of interaction so that we can manipulate it directly and see the output. So that's what I've done here is there's got D3 brush, so I'm brushing on it. And then this chart um, yields just like a range slider would. Um, except it yields sort of the, the data points that you've selected. And so just by brushing back and forth here and using the default object inspector, I can see what these stocks are. So like that's the price line group in some pharmaceutical, which I assume they like, uh, I think they went public like at the start of this data set. But the interesting thing for me is like all the ones down here on the left. Um, does anybody have any guesses what they are from 2007? So it was shortly before the financial crisis, and so this is like E-Trade Financial and all of the other sort of like financial firms that basically collapsed and had to get bailed out by the government. Um, but it's cool that you can just sort of see that directly from this visualization here, um, building it up incrementally. Okay, just to show that there's no real magic going on under the hood here, this is the code that I wrote to adapt sort of your standard D3 brush that you would write today to this sort of generator-based um, system. So whenever there's a brush event, you can look at the selection, and then you can use that selection to filter your data. So picking the stocks that had a change value between you know, the lower bound and the upper bound of your selection, and then you're just setting that as the value and then dispatching this input event so that it triggers the update. Now, normally in, in reactive programming and in this environment, your reactions are instantaneous, but sometimes it's beneficial for them not to be instantaneous. You actually want to observe the changes from one state to another state. So similarly, like we had with the um, canvas example, we can use the previous value of the cell in order to define sort of your standard D3 transitions and using the data join. So here I've got a stagger transition on a, data tr on a bar chart. And I've got a data set that I'm going to sort based on this like little checkbox here, switching between uh, descending frequency, this is letters in the English language, and just lexicographic order. So if I click that checkbox here, it's just running that same code. 
Uh, and because it has access to the previous chart, it's not throwing it away, and it can just do your sort of standard uh, D3 data join stuff in order to make uh, an animation there. Okay, so inline visual outputs improve our ability to inspect the program's current state. Um, but there's more that we can do with interactive programming uh, to understand not just the current state, but to understand the behavior of a program. And we can do that by poking, by changing, deleting, and reordering code, and seeing what happens. And so in this notebook, I've got sort of your typical force-directed graph, and I've got the simulation here, which is driving the layout, and by sort of commenting out the different forces, I can see what effect they're having on the layout. So I turned out the charge force, and everything collapsed, because the charge force is what's causing these nodes to sort of pull apart from each other. Likewise, if I change the strength of that charge, then it sort of all collapses on itself. And that was because normally the charge is negative, right, so that they repel each other. If you change them to be positive, they're all pulling each other towards the center and there's nothing, there's no equilibrium. It just goes into chaos. <laughs> so I can tinker with the forces here. I can choose, like, what's the right value. Um, I can play with the link force and turn that off too. And it sort of explodes. Or I turn off, like, the centering force. And then it just kind of floats away. <laughs> um, yeah. So and you've probably seen little uh, tinker toys like this before, where you have a force layout, and there are like some sliders, like that GUI or whatever, where you're, where you're playing with the parameters. Um, but the thing that's kind of cool here is that you didn't have to build any specific interface to do that. It just sort of came for free with the reactive programming model, just by tinkering with the code. Now, a more explicit approach um, is to expose the internal state of our code uh, as it's running so that we can study it with visualization. Um, generators can help with that as well. So I'll give an example. So this is just a very simple function which computes a sum of an array of numbers. Um, and what we can do is turn that into a generator. So that basically means we put a star here and then we add this yield value. And so now the idea is like we have an extra channel where we can emit information from our code and use that in order to construct visualizations or animations to understand the behavior of the code. Uh, and that's important because it gives a cleaner separation between the implementation of the algorithm and how we study it, how we explore it. And so there are two ways we can call the generator like this. So one is you just call it directly, and then you get an animation, just like we did with the rotating projection. And the other way is you use this like, little ellipsis here in an array. And then it's actually going to pull all of the values at once out of that generator. And so you get a nice, like, static um, data set, and you can then construct a static visualization of your program's behavior rather than just being limited to animations. So obviously, like, understanding, like, a running sum isn't particularly interesting. Um, so I'm going to use, like, a more concrete example here. We're going to get deep into computational geometry. Probably weren't expecting that at this conference, but here it comes. Um, so this is uh, D3's hierarchical circle packing layout. Um, it's a bit like a tree map, um, except it's not quite as space efficient as a tree, tree map, but you can see sort of the structure of the hierarchy a little bit better. So this sort of technique is commonly used to understand sort of like where your disk space is gone or how you're using a file system. So in this case, like this is Flare, uh, which is another visualization toolkit, uh, and looking at the sizes of the different source code files uh, organized by their package hierarchy. So one of the tasks here is that you have to, you have all of these circles, and you want to pack them into as small a place, as small a space as possible without overlap, like uh, huddling penguins in Antarctica. Um, and so your, our job is to place circles one at a time until all of the circles have been placed. Okay, since we want uh, the circles to be packed as tightly as possible, uh, it's fairly obvious that each circle that we place must be tangent to at least one and actually two of the circles that we've already placed. But if we just pick an existing circle at random as the tangent circle, then we're going to waste a lot of time trying to place the new circle in, this, in the middle of the pack, where it's going to overlap with the circles that we've already placed. So ideally, we only consider the circles that are on the outside of the pack. But the problem is, how do we efficiently determine which circles are on the outside? So what D3 uses and other implementations of this layout use, it's called Wang's algorithm, and it maintains this front chain, which is shown in red, and that represents the outermost circles. So when it's placing a new circle, it's going to pick the circle on the front chain that is closest to the origin, to the center, 
And then the new circle is placed tangent to that circle and its neighbor on the front chain. So if this placement does not overlap with any circle on the front chain, then the algorithm can just move on to the next circle. But if it does overlap, like in this example here, this black circle is overlapping with these other circles on the front chain, uh, then you have to cut the front chain between the tangent circle and the overlapping circle, and it sort of like expands the front chain out. Uh, and that way, if you apply that process a few times, the new circle that you place won't be tangent to any other circle. So I find this animation a little bit mesmerizing, uh, and I, the moments I like are when the large circles kind of like get forced out of the pack. There's a, like a very quick animation of only a few frames where they kind of get squeezed out. Um, but more than just being kind of cool to look at, um, this notebook was extremely useful for me for fixing a long-standing bug in D3's implementation, where very rarely it would cut the wrong side of the front chain and the circles would end up overlapping. Um, and actually, I, I discovered another bug just last week with a different visualization here, but uh, it's, it's been great. So um, once you've packed the circles, you're not totally done. You also need to compute the enclosing circle of that pack so that you can then repeat, repeat the process in the rest of the hierarchy. And the conventional way of doing that is to just scan the front chain and picking the circle that is the farthest from the origin. And that tends to do a pretty good approximation because these packs end up being roughly circular, uh, but it's not exact. And I, a year ago or so, I discovered there's this other algorithm called Weltzel's algorithm for computing the smallest enclosing circle in linear time. And it, I think it's also pretty cool, so I'm going to show you how that one works. Um, so let's assume that we already have the enclosing circle for some circles. And now we, again, want to do this incrementally. We want to incorporate a new circle into the enclosing circle. Now that sounds a little bit circular that we already know the answer. Um, but this is like a proof by induction, all right, or any sort of like recursive process, as you'll see. Um, but I'm not going to give you like a rigorous proof of this. It's not enough time, and also I probably just couldn't do it, frankly. <laughs> um, but I want to give you like an intuition uh, so that you can get a sense of how this algorithm works. So if the new circle is inside, then we don't have to do anything. We just move on to the next circle. But again, if the new circle is outside of our enclosing circle, then we're going to have to compute the new enclosing circle. But we actually already know something about this new circle. It's the only circle that is outside the enclosing circle. And thus, it must be tangent to whatever the new enclosing circle is, which is in this case is this one. So we don't really know yet what the other tangent circles are, but we know what one of the tangent circles are. And that means that we can apply this process recursively in order to find the other tangent circles. OK, so I'm glossing over a lot of geometry here. There are also like boundary conditions that you have to worry about. Like you need to know what the enclosing circle is for one, two, or three circles. And that last one's called the problem of Apollonius. It has a cool math world page with lots of pretty diagrams. Um, but the point is, like with a little bit of geometry combined with this intuition, you can get a sense of, of how this process works. And understanding that it's a recursive process, we can now sort of see a more complete picture of this algorithm. So the first one that I showed you was really just sort of the top level of the algorithm. And now these are like up to four levels of the algorithm. You can't ever get more than three tangent circles, so that's why there can't be more than four circles that are drawn up here. Um, and as you are iterating over your circles and you find one of the circles that's outside of your enclosing circle, I've said circle like 5,000 times, um, <laughs> it has to recurse. It knows it has a tangent circle and it has to move to the right. So it's like heading one level deeper into the dream. Uh, and then popping back up again until you finally get your results. Um, okay. okay, so in addition, oh, I'll show that again, but in addition to showing how this algorithm works, the algorithm gives a sense of how much time the algorithm spends, or the animation gives a sense of how much time the algorithm spends at different levels of recursion. So you can see that it converges very quickly on an approximate answer. But when it encounters a circle that's outside, it then has to rescan all of the circles that it looked at previously in order to compute a new enclosing circle. So it ends up being more expensive when it finds a new circle that's outside in order to validate the new result. OK. So one way to write less code is to reuse it. And the 450,000 or so packages published to NPM attest to the popularity of this approach. But libraries are an example of active reusability, right? They must be intentionally designed to be reusable, and this is a substantial burden. It can be hard to design an effective general abstraction. Just ask any open source maintainer. 
Uh, in contrast, implementing one-off code like you see in many D3 examples is much easier. You're only concerned with sort of the task at hand and not some general abstract class of tasks. So what I'd like to explore with D3 Express is whether we can have better passive reusability, sort of something in between one-off code and sort of nicely packaged up reusable code, where by leveraging the structure of these reactive documents, we can more easily repurpose code, even if that code wasn't carefully designed to be reusable. So what I mean by this is, for starters, you can treat your notebooks like de facto libraries. So I don't know if you saw that, but in this notebook here, I've sort of defined a color interpolator. This is like implementing terrain.colors from R using D3HSV. It's just sort of used for elevation data or, or topographic maps sometimes. So I've defined that in one notebook, and what I want to do is use this color scale in another notebook. And I haven't published that to NPM, but I can import that from the other notebook by just saying import interpolate terrain from the name of that other notebook, um, and then I can start to use it. And so this is nice for sort of reusing code that you wrote from another notebook. Um, I can also imagine this technique being useful if you, for example, you have a lot of different notebooks that you used for exploration, and then you want to combine those together into your final write-up. You don't have to copy your code from those separate notebooks. You can just import the symbols and then write around it and add extra explanation. Now, more interestingly, you can do uh, rewiring of these definitions as part of the import process. So I'll give you an example. So this is a data set where I'm streaming data over WebSockets. Um, and so whenever it gets a new event, it's going to sort of like add uh, a new datum to the array and shift the old one off so that it's a moving window. Um, again, like the details of this code don't really matter. I'm not imagining that people would write all of this code for all of their real-time data sets. You'd probably have like an API or something to load these streaming data sets. But I, I still want to show you that it's, it's relatively straightforward in order to construct these using the generators. So this is what the data set looks like. It's just an array of 300 things, and you can see that it's sort of shifting off, representing sort of a recent time window here. Let's see, why is that not playing? OK. So now you saw from before, we had a chart that did a line chart from before. And so this data set, I mean, it's real time, but it's basically the same structure as our old chart. So the question is, can we reuse our old chart to show this data set? And the answer is yes, as you'll see. So this is the chart that I've imported from the other notebook. It's actually a, a slightly different definition using Canvas rather than SVG. And so now all I've done is I added a little with clause here to inject our data into this chart definition. So we're just replacing that definition. And you can see that it's now a real-time chart that's sort of ticking as I get new data from the server uh, without having to change anything else about the, the chart definition. But the cool thing is I can actually customize that chart definition a little bit more if I want to. So I'm going to load D3. And one of the things that I want to do here is I want to fix the Y scale so that they don't sort of bounce up and down as the extent of my data changes. So I just want like a fixed value. Say it represents like what the expected values are for this data set. And that way, it won't sort of bounce up and down distractingly. So in order to do that, I need to import some other symbols. I need to know what the size of the chart is. Um, but then after that, I can inject my Y definition. And so now the chart is, has got this fixed range. And similarly, I can do the same thing uh, with the X scale. So like, let's say rather than, again, deriving the domain of the X scale from the data, I just want to have like a fixed moving window so that it updates at 60 frames per second. So I'll do that with the generator. And here, it's like a generator that emits the X scale, uh, where the domain of the X scale is based on the current time. So I'll finish typing that. And then go up to the import statement and inject the X. Right? So now it's, it's smoothly sliding rather than ticking every update. OK, so the last concept that I want to talk about is that because these notebooks run in the browser and not in a desktop app or on the cloud, um, it's a web-first discovery environment. Like All the computation and rendering happens locally inside the client. So what does that mean? Well, a web-first environment has to embrace web standards, including vanilla JavaScript and DOM. It works with today's open source, whether that's example code that you find in a tutorial or libraries that are published to NPM. 
uh, and it minimizes the specialized knowledge that you need in order to be productive in that environment. There is some new syntax in D3 Express for reactivity, but I've tried to keep it as small and as familiar as possible, uh, such as by using generators. Um, so these are the four different ways that you can define cells or variables in D3 Express, and these are just expressions, uh, block statement, the funky block statement preceded by an asterisk, which means that it's a generator, and then your sort of standard function declaration here. And the idea is that by having sort of minimal syntax, it's, it's very different from, let's say, using a reactive framework, where there's a lot of boilerplate sort of API that you're wrapping on top of your code here. I want to make the reactiveness feel like a, more of a language feature or something that's intrinsic to the programming environment rather than a layer that you add on top of that. And that's important, too, if you want to take this code and pull it out and, and put it into your React app. There's not really anything that you have to remove in order to plug that in there. You're just trading one reactive environment for another reactive environment. So another um, important principle is that the web-first environment lets you run your code anywhere, right? Because your code is running in the browser. Uh, there's nothing to install, which means that it's easier for others to repeat and validate your analysis. Like, you didn't have to reproduce the exact environment or install the right set of packages in order to run your code. If it's running in your browser, it's going to run in your reader's browser browsers as well. And that means that you can transition more easily from your exploration to your explanation. You don't have to start over from scratch, switching from one tool or one environment to another in order to communicate whatever it is that you've learned um, in your discovery process. So to keep a comparison to what's commonly done today, you know, we might publish a model or some data sets up to GitHub. Um, and what I'm trying to do is to make this process a little bit richer, I guess, like to make it so that the ability for our readers to reproduce these environments and run this code is, is easier, it's, it's, the bar is lowered. We don't have to sort of read these long instructions in order to reproduce these environments. We can just sort of run them directly. And I'll end on like another sort of Victor quote. Well, I have a little bit more to say after this, but the point here is making your code for analysis more portable can have a transformative effect on how we communicate. Um, so to quote Brett Victor again, uh, an active reader asks questions, considers alternatives, questions assumptions, and even questions the trustworthiness of the author. An active reader tries to generalize specific examples and devise specific examples for generalities. An active reader doesn't passively sponge up information, but uses the author's argument as a springboard for critical thought and deep understanding. So the point is, if the code is running in your reader's browser, they have a much better ability to see how that code works, to tinker with the code, to change some of the assumptions that you make, to fork it into another environment and start doing some new things, um, or even to just explore interactively because the code is, again, running inside of their browser. Okay, now for the disappointment. Um, as much as I want to release D3 Express, um, this is quite different from sort of library stuff. There's a lot more work here when you're building a platform, a service for people to use in addition to the software. Um, and so it's not really ready for you to go yet and, and start using it. Um, I was trying frantically to, to release a part of it uh, by the time of this talk, but it, <laughs> it'll still be a few more days. So if you want to try it out, uh, you can go to this URL and you can sign up for it. You can also get in touch with me. Um, if you want to help me build it, um, if you're also looking for a job, um, also get in touch with me. I would love help doing this, so thank you. <laughs>